Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on another muggy and shitty Florida morning. I mean, there's no question at all. It rained heavily last night, and now all that water is starting to bake off the ground and, you know, causing humidity in probably the 180, 190 percent range. So that's just super. But uh, like I said uh, in the last video, it's now September. Uh, that uh, brings hope with it. Uh, October can sometimes even be nice. So. Uh, good weather may not be that far away, and even though I'm dripping and shitty and horrible and miserable right now, uh, there is a strong chance that even as soon as a month from now, uh, that things could get a little bit better. So I'm going to keep that hope alive and uh, be optimistic. Uh, animals at an absolute minimum haven't seen anything, anything. Uh, you know, I bought this uh, insecticide off Amazon recently. It was called Demon Something, and I, I had uh, animals inside the house. We have an extermination company, but they sporadically come and they call seven minutes before they're going to arrive and we're not always there. So we ended up with ants. So I bought this shit uh, to sort of supplement them and uh, it was fantastic. I have to say, it kills everything. Everything. Uh, nothing lives within a 20 mile radius of this shit when you spray it around. Uh, in fact, toddlers, dogs, birds fall out of the air. Uh, it is the uh, the most fantastic stuff that I mean, I may even put a link to the ad in this video uh, for anyone out there who's dealing with any kind of a pest problem. Let me tell you, this is the stuff you want to have. It's just absolutely uh, a very, very violent thing, and uh, you won't have to deal with any insects afterwards, I promise. So, uh, anyway, I, I'm digressing again, and I, <laughs> these videos too damn long, so I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to make them faster, and we're going to get right into this thing, which is a 1986 Toyota pickup truck. Uh, this one happens to be uh, a 4x4 with the uh, SR5 package, which we'll get into a little bit more as we go. Um, I'm going to say right off the bat, look, I'm not an expert in these things. This is not one of the cars that I know a whole lot about. I mean, it is a car of my youth, as I do like to do uh, in these videos. I mean, a lot of kids drove these in the high school I was at or wanted to. Uh, probably much more of them than the ones who actually did. And uh, they were around, and they were cool, and they were thought of as cool at the time, which was obviously evidenced by that um, uh, little appearance, one of them. I think that was a turbo model with an extra extra cab that showed up in Back to the Future. Uh, obviously, that's going to be probably the most famous Toyota truck reference in history. Uh, but uh, it was a big deal, and people did want them. And uh, it's fun to have one now. I picked this up, I don't know, a couple of months ago. I've been playing with it. Uh, you know, it's I haven't really been driving it much, but it's just been kind of fun to look at. But, you know, times are tough. <laughs> it's time to sell some cars. I had thought about running this thing through Meekum in January, but uh, but the hell with it. It's going to go up for sale now. And uh, if it doesn't sell, we'll do it then. But otherwise, meh, there it is. Here it is. All right, so the Toyota pickup. Uh, we'll get into that really, really quick. I mean, it's the favorite truck of high school athletes, your grandfather, pool maintenance companies, accountants with a weekend cowboy thing, and, uh, of course, ISIS. Uh, the one thing those people all have in common is that they know a good truck when they see one, and Toyota has pretty much delivered on that front, and they've been delivering on that front Oh, God, you know, probably since the 1930s, but uh, truly at least since the start of the North American pickup truck series uh, in, the, uh, in the 1960s in the United States. So uh, they have a reputation that's enviable. I mean, in fact, it's probably the most enviable reputation in all of the automotive industry. I mean, these things are thought of as completely indestructible. Uh, in fact, there was a, uh, a Top Gear set segment um, not that many years ago where, uh, you know, they tried to destroy a Toyota Hilux and uh, it came in three parts. It was very popular. The truck still survived. They dropped it from cranes. They buried it in the ocean. They did all kinds of terrible things to it. And still the damn thing did survive. And, uh, you know, I don't know how accurate that clip was truly or if it was a fair test uh, but it certainly does prove the point that the reputation exists and uh, that it's a very very big deal so I'll leave a you know, link to that in the, uh, the description content as well 
So basically, I mean, if you're Marty McFly looking for a dirty weekend in the woods with Jennifer or uh, Al-Qaeda needing something to mount a 30 millimeter machine gun or run some child soldiers around, uh, the one thing you need and want is reliability and Toyota basically delivers. So, uh, so there it is. That's the uh, briefest of mentions of the reputation of the Toyota truck, which uh, of course it still enjoys today. Uh, okay, briefly, the history of Toyota. And I do mean briefly because this is just not going to be a 40 minute video. This one's going to be fast as hell. Uh, Toyota came into existence in 1924, more or less, uh, but not as a car company. It was with a D, Toyota, uh, invented what he called the Type G automatic loom, uh, you know, to weave cotton or other fabrics or whatnot. And uh, apparently it was a pretty friggin' great loom. Uh, the most interesting feature of it was that it would stop automatically if a problem ensued. And that was important because it wouldn't waste any material. So uh, I guess normal looms at that time, if you know something happened, it started weaving crappy cloth, it would just keep going and it would waste all kinds of raw material. Not so with Toyota's loom, which would stop right away. And uh, that actually became a feature of the Toyota car company later on, up to and including the point where you know, any assembly line worker could basically stop the assembly line if they saw something that they didn't like. But, um, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, if the loom was getting a bad weave, then it stopped. And that was a big deal. And, uh, you know, we've all seen bad weaves and nobody wants one of those. So, uh, so that failsafe became a philosophy to, uh, for Toyota. And, you know, and, uh, down through the years, that probably helped them make trucks with reputations like this. So, uh, but anyway, the loom was great so some British company decided they wanted it they paid him a hundred thousand pounds sterling for it which was a shitload of money uh, obviously in 1924 and what he did was he used that money to get the capital uh, to start a car company which would be headed up by his son Bob um, Okay, I'm kidding. His name was not Bob. It was actually Sakichi. Uh, but uh, anyway, so Bob or Sakichi started, uh, he, had, he had sort of toured around the United States for a while studying the automotive industry. Obviously a smart kid, obviously well-to-do, you know, probably came over here and had some fun in the strip clubs and whatnot, but, um, but otherwise did take it seriously. He even, he even met with Henry Ford to talk about producing cars. So, uh, you know, it was something that he really definitely wanted to do and do well. So he took dad's money, he started developing engines, he started developing cars, and in 1935, Toyota, uh, again with a D, under the auspices of the Toyota Loom Company, uh, released their first two vehicles, the A1 car and uh, the G1 truck. So even right off the bat, they were making trucks. Uh, you know, these things, I guess they did fairly well in Japan, and in 1937, uh, the company moved out from under the auspices of the Toyota Automatic Loom Company and became the Toyota, uh, now with a T, uh, motor company. Apparently because the T made the brush strokes easier in Japanese, uh, the D was complicated to draw, the T was not. And uh, it um, sounded smoother off the tongue, apparently. And, uh, and probably most of all, it didn't mean very literally fertile rice patties. Uh, it's also worth mentioning that the guy who came up with that was not uh, a true Toyota. He was somebody who had married into the company, so he wasn't beloved of the name. But uh, anyway, so that's why uh, Toyota with a D became Toyota with a T. And uh, they went on to become quite a big car company, quite a big uh, industry in Japan. And and uh, in fact, helped Datsun get their start. Uh, they uh, obviously had a lot to do with uh, machinery production during World War II, helping the Axis powers do what they do. They, you know, had their fair share of slave labor, as did the uh, German car companies. They engaged in you know, the use of comfort women, and apparently just had a great old time in World War II. I think some of the executives actually end up uh, being uh, tried for war crimes and, you know, went to jail for a while, so... Yeah, probably deserved. But anyway, so Toyota and, you know, Japan essentially got their ass kicked in World War II. They had all those <clears throat> large bombs dropped on them. They were kind of devastated, but they needed to keep going after the war, and uh, they did so. I mean, there was... Um, 
the rebuilding of Japan to do, you know, they had to consider that. So, uh, you know, the military occupiers, us, the United States, decided that they needed trucks to do that. So uh, even though they were banned from making cars, uh, in Japan, they could make trucks stayed with the reconstruction, and uh, and so they did, and they made tough and durable little trucks that you know did quite well, and uh, helped Japan sort of create a bigger economy. Uh, that went on to where Japan started to compete with uh, some of the American makers trying to make vehicles for the Korean War, uh, you know, for the Allied forces, and of course, you know, they had an advantage because they're over there at the time, so they're able to make these things without shipping them. I don't know how the well that when. I think uh, mostly the Korean War, if what I remember from MASH, uh, you saw American Jeeps, but uh, you know, Japan and Toyota did do their bit and tried to, um, you know, tried to make some vehicles that would work that way. But uh, it, it, that effort gave them very firm roots in making rugged and dependable trucks for utilitarian purposes. And that philosophy, that experience would serve them well over the years. Uh, the first time that really came to fruition was with the Land Cruiser, the FJ-40. There was actually a precursor to that that did well. Uh, but the FJ-40 was actually released to the North American market. And I mean, it didn't sound like hotcakes. It sold well enough. It sold better than the Toyota cars that came over at the time. Uh, but um, it was rugged, it was dependable, and it started to create a cult following for Toyota uh, that would last for decades and decades and frankly continues today. Uh, even briefly, there was an FJ45 pickup truck model, which looked a little bit like an inner, you know, Japan sort of copied designs at that point. They were sort of famous for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, they copied them well, and that's all you had to do. So they made an FJ45, which looked a little bit like an international harvester pickup truck. It didn't sell particularly well, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, it did uh, create, the, you know, it created a buzz, if you will. Fast forward a few years to 1964, and Toyota introduced its first true North American pickup truck model uh, in earnest, and that was the Stout. Not the Scout, but the Stout with a T. Um, it did not sell well the first year. In fact, they only sold four of them, so you can't really say that it was a giant sales success. Did a little bit better the second year when it sold 900, uh, but uh, still, you're talking about a microscopic uh, amount of production. In fact, in 19, what the hell was it? In 2014, uh, Toyota was celebrating selling. Uh, 20 million vehicles a year and had produced more than 200 billion <laughs> vehicles. So we're, you know, when we're talking about numbers like four and 900, it's not all that impressive, but uh, it did sort of open the door for what Toyota was gonna do. And forgive me, I know I'm rambling here, but I'm gonna try and get through it. So uh, here it was, in 1968, the first real competitive Toyota truck came out, uh, and that was the Hilux. That name, by the way, would continue throughout most of the world, but not in North America. It, uh, in fact, only lasted through the first generation in North America. Uh, after that, it just became the Toyota pickup truck. But the Hilux sold very, very well and found that there was a market for small, durable, rugged trucks that could do what they were supposed to do without too many problems. Uh, it had ridiculous high-mounted turn signals, which... Um, you know, if you look at it, you think, what the hell were they thinking? Well, you know, at the time, the Japanese market required that every fender on these cars had the uh, rearview mirrors mounted. That was not the case in America. They didn't need fender-mounted rearview mirrors. So uh, the fenders they were producing had these holes in them up front. Uh, so rather than come up with a North American fender, they used the Japanese fenders and just put turn signals there and uh, thus had these weird strange high-mounted turn signals that uh, are pretty unique and kind of cool looking today. Uh, but uh, it did well, it sold well, and, um, you know, people liked it. Uh, it was something that, uh, you know, had started to make a name for them. The next generation, second gen Hilux, came out in 1973, better styled, more peppy, you know, had a bit more juice under the hood, certainly more than the Stout ever did, which was part of what killed that. 
Uh, and uh, for the first time, it was offered with a long bed, and people started buying these things because they were rugged, dependable, durable, did what they were supposed to do. Uh, you know, they were primitive by any standards. They had steel dashboards. They weren't that comfortable inside. Uh, but, uh, you know, they did everything right. They didn't break down. They got good gas mileage. They, you know, had a tremendous utilitarian purpose and uh, basically created, you know, this small truck market. Um, that one ran through 1978 uh, and lost the Hilux name along the way. And towards the end of its run, it came out with an SR5 model, uh, which again was pioneering. And there's now the birds are going completely ape shit all of a sudden. There's one right overhead. <sighs> anyway, um, the SR5 model was also a pioneering thing uh, because it was the first sort of sporty truck. It had a bigger gasoline engine with more horsepower and uh, it, it pioneered this sport truck market, uh, which uh, of course would come into play as, uh, as time went on. Uh, 79 third gen comes out and now we're really getting somewhere all of a sudden the automotive press is all over these things the you know the cult following is all over these things people are absolutely loving them and then in 81 a sea change happened and that was the introduction of the 4x4 and uh, that changed everything because all of a sudden it just made a truck that people really wanted in terms of you know not having a pool company to go and run chemicals around but actually to have fun on the weekends to you know go where people couldn't normally go and standard pickup trucks and it used most uh, sort of the mechanicals from the Land Cruiser. Uh, it had a two gear transfer case with a crawl mode which was you know real off wheel real four by four stuff and uh, of course it instantly began uh, you know gained a huge cult following. Uh, also in that generation it was the first time the 22R appeared under the hood of one of these things replacing the 20R uh, and the 22R I believe might even still be used today. I mean, it is considered one of the most unbelievable engines of all time in terms of reliability, durability, ruggedness. You know, the, the mileage is almost irrelevant. You can just put on as many as you want uh, and uh, came in very, you know, many incarnations. So it was a very, very big deal. And, uh, and that was that. Uh, that then leads us to this fourth generation truck, which is just like this one here. Came out in 1984 and ran through 1988. Uh, also saw the birth of the Forerunner, uh, the first one, which uh, came out in 84 as an 85 model, the sort of primitive early SUV uh, that, um, you know, would pave the way for, you know, lesbians to have something to drive many years later. So there we are. That's the birth of Toyota up until this fourth gen Toyota truck. And uh, now we're just going to dive deeply into this one. And obviously this is a opportune time for me to pause, get my glasses defogged. And uh, then we're just going to hop right into this truck. So hold on a minute. All right, so let's just dive straight into this one. As you can see, the design is quite handsome. I do like the square lights up front. I like the fender flares. Uh, I believe this one has a uh, lift kit, if you will. Uh, not sure what size, probably two to four inches, somewhere in that, uh, that's what she said. Somewhere in that zone anyway, and, uh, and it looks quite nice. Uh, it's running oversized uh, all-terrain TA uh, tires on the factory alloy rims from the SR5 package. Uh, it looks great, and the SR5 stuff adds things that were essentially luxurious at the time, but really don't amount to all that much today. I mean, it's stuff that everything has now. You know, things like a right side mirror and, you know, some chrome trim here and there and, uh, you know, fancier seats and yeah, wing mirrors and that sort of thing. And, you know, sliding rear window. I mean, this stuff is all pretty standard on even the cheapest truck now. But at the time, it meant something uh, even more, uh, far more than it does today. Uh, but the design is quite nice. I like the power hump in the hood. I like the uh, six uh, compartment grill with the Toyota logo. It looks nice with the chrome bumpers. It's got a little bit of an air dam down there with the tow hook. Uh, if you look low, you can see it has a skid plate. Uh, these were pretty serious off-road machines uh, designed to be so. And uh, of course, that's a big part of what made them so successful and what made people like them. Uh, you can just see it looks very, very attractive and just, you know, nice size ride height. Uh, this 
this generation not only was the first 4x4, uh, actually the prior gen, mind you, but this one brought the first independent front suspension. Uh, before this, they had solid front axles, which are, of course, good for off-roading, but uh, for driving around town, the independent was better. Uh, you could also get a turbo in this model, which was an answer to the V6s that started coming out. You know, GM and Ford had decided that this was a hot market, which uh, Toyota had helped establish. So out came the S10, if you remember that, and uh, of course the Ford Ranger, and they had V6s in them, uh, you know, or certainly available V6s, uh, which people at the time thought were great. You know, even though the 2.8 that came out in the S10 was an absolute shit engine. Uh, at the time, it was thought to be pretty good and maybe even superior to the lower horsepower 4 in the Toyota. So as a Band-Aid approach, Toyota made a turbo model on the 22R. Uh, which, um, in fact, I believe the Back to the Future truck was a turbo, uh, but uh, that only lasted through 87 until Toyota came out with their own V6. And, yeah, you know, frankly, I think the purists like the four cylinders. Again, the 22R uh, and RE, the injection version, considered the best engines maybe ever made, so uh, that's probably the one to have. But anyway, let's start inside the bed. So that's all pretty standard. Now, when I got this thing, I removed the uh, bed liner that it had. Now, that did wear through the paint a little bit. You can see this little bit of surface rust here. I haven't done anything with that yet because this is the original paint. And that's a pretty big deal because on these beds, most of these things are absolutely smoked. Uh, here's a quick little aside on Toyota beds. Back in the 60s, there was a big tariff on imported light-duty trucks, like 25%. Uh, versus 4% if it wasn't a truck. So uh, Toyota contracted with a company called Atlas Manufacturing, and they would send over bedless trucks to the United States, and then Atlas would make beds for them, uh, and then they would be sold at the Toyota dealership, and that was a way around that 25% uh, tariff. It only got 4%. Uh, later on, Toyota bought Atlas to, uh, you know, keep that ball rolling. Uh, but from what I hear, like those three uh, indentation boxes up there in the front, apparently those things are usually banged up and dented it in and horrifying so uh, the bed on this truck from what I understand and this is from a Toyota enthusiast not me uh, is supposedly pretty special so yeah you know I can live with that uh, I may end up clear coating this to uh, keep it from rusting further not sure that I want to paint it uh, or uh, maybe I'll do nothing at all so <laughs> you tell me if this is a truck you want to buy and you call auto house you tell them what you want to do and we'll probably have no issue doing it for you so anyway, there's the bed of this thing, which is a nice standard size. Glad it's not a long bed. Uh, they're more useful, but they don't look as cool to me. And, uh, you know, everything pretty lovely back there. I love the uh, graphics on the side. That is such a Toyota thing. Uh, those SR5 wheels, again, beautiful with the all-terrain tires. Uh, there you can see the uh, underneath. This was a Tacoma truck, uh, Washington. It was sold in and up there, which apparently is not a salt state. So uh, the uh, vehicles up the yeah they get preserved very nice if this thing was sold in Massachusetts it'd be all right it'd be powder by now it'd just be gone uh, you can see the four-wheel drive mud flaps kind of cool like that they're still on there and uh, yeah you know otherwise everything nice and proper let's have a look under the hood I have to remember to not ramble and ramble and ramble <laughs> let's keep the ball rolling even has a big graphic on the hood, which is kind of cool. Oh, come on, where is this thing? Okay, Toyota has a prop rod, which honestly, I would prefer struts, but again, utilitarian. So there it is, there is a 22RE. That means it's fuel injected, which was, uh, this gen was the first to have that. Uh, it bumped up the horsepower to like 116 or so, which was pretty good at the time, but not good enough for the uh, V6S10, thus the turbo. But frankly, I'm glad this isn't the turbo model. Uh, you can see again, the look of this thing, everything is pretty rust free under here, 
which is just astounding. Uh, you know, this thing has led a very soft life. Still has the original uh, VIN plate back there. Uh, this head was rebuilt uh, just a few thousand miles ago. Uh, the guy who owned this thing owned an import repair shop. This was kind of his baby truck, his fun thing he played with. And uh, from what I understand, the heads on these things are, I won't call them glass jawed, but I was surprised to find out that the timing chains or gears would wear out, that other stuff would happen. I thought they were just endlessly bulletproof. You didn't have to do anything but change the oil and they'd go for billions of miles. But apparently that's not the case. Uh, they do require some maintenance and every 150,000 miles or so, uh, it's not an, a bad idea to rework the heads. So the guy did on this one and uh, it's uh, all very nice and uh, ready to go under there. And of course that's made it to a, a five-speed manual gearbox with a two-speed uh, two uh, gear uh, transfer case for uh, your off-roading and yeah, everything looking pretty good in there. So, all right, let's get that back down. Now I'm debating whether to pause now and just hop in with my stuff and uh, do the video and go. In fact, uh, that is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put my crap inside and uh, then we'll just go for a spin. Alright, so I put my crap actually in the bed, which uh, feels a little bit strange to me, but it doesn't look like it's going to rain, so it should be fine. Uh, there you can see, by the way, the sliding back window. That's part of that SR5 thing, as are the chrome door handles and stripes and wheels and some of the other stuff on the truck. And that's, you know, that's all very nice. Uh, Alright, let's have a look inside. Okay, so you have a very attractive and, to me, utilitarian, but at the time, again, the SR5 package actually made this thing a bit of a Cadillac in the Toyota world. Uh, you have reclining bucket seats instead of a bench, nice stuff. Uh, you've got a center console. Uh, you've got a tilt steering wheel, lovely. Uh, you've got these sort of upgraded door panels with carpet and cloth and armrests. Uh, you've got these little, uh, look at that, enjoy Ming finish. I Imagine that's some sort of wash frequently. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, but anyway, you've got these little smoker vent windows, which are nice. You can crank this down. And in fact, while I'm walking around so I don't have to lean over and do it, I'm going to go over here and lower this one. I don't think I'm going to do a highway run in this car, by the way. I don't really see the point. I mean, it's not a speed demon, obviously. And, uh, you know, we get it. It rides fine. <clears throat> uh, actually, while I'm here, I'll show you this back here. When I lower that, uh, there you can see uh, part of the original jacking hardware and uh, the original uh, Toyota toolkit, which is nice to see still with the truck. Uh, there's the uh, transfer case instructions uh, on the glove box. Uh, it still has the original dealer envelope, which again, this is all neat stuff to see. And the two original keys, one of them... Uh, padded, if you will, or plastic, the other one not. Um, you get inside of here, you've got your owner's manual and some other, you know, 1986 owner's guide. There's a picture of an MR2. I think that was the first year for that, so try not to screw this up as I'm putting it away. But uh, all very nice to see that with the truck. Uh, the original headliner, nice. Still even the original... Um, instructions up there for, I don't know what the hell that is, we'll see when I walk over there. But uh, otherwise everything looking really good in here. There's my crap in the back, hope it lives. Alright, let's fire this thing up. It's a bit of a step up, but not too bad. Uh, my friend Robert, Robert the Polak, I talked about him recently in the other video where I was going to Sebring with him, which I did, and actually did fairly well. I finished 8th and 7th in my class, which is better than usual. Um, but uh, I tell you what, man, Robert is completely psychotic. Uh, psychotic. Uh, I mean, we were knee-walking drunk uh, Friday, sorry, yeah, Friday and Saturday night. Saturday night, he decides he wants to do a lap of Sebring at 12.30 in the morning. Uh, I don't even want to know what our blood alcohol level was. He did it first on my little scooter, a little Yamaha Vino that I brought. And then we do it in his insane and stupid F-350 uh, with a giant lift kit that I can barely get in and out of, never mind when I'm drunk. And, uh, you know, a bannable offense by the... <laughs> I hope nobody forwards this to the SECA. Uh, we drive around the track... Uh, 
Anyway, needless to say, I miss my lunatic friends who are in New Orleans because, frankly, they're, you know, much saner than Robert is. He's completely out of his friggin' mind. But uh, anyway, I digress. Uh, so here you have a very... 80s instrument cluster. I like the grid, the graph stuff behind it. It's kind of a, you know, Tron 85, computers are coming, what have you. Uh, we've got the full gauge package, which is part of that SR5, so you've got your temp gauge, your oil pressure gauge, your voltmeter, your fuel. Uh, you've got a tack and, of course, the miles per hour. Uh, this is a tilt wheel. There's a little controller right here. You can move it up or down, get it where you want it to be. And, of course, that was very, very luxurious at the time. Uh, this safety cancel thing is kind of interesting. Um, that will turn off the ignition, I believe. Uh, it's a four-wheeling device that, um, you know, if you find yourself in a horrible predicament where everything's precarious, uh, you turn that on and you can use the starter uh, to crank the engine to give you just a little bit of chugging to get out of some problems problems without actually firing the vehicle up. So uh, that's an interesting little button there. Uh, here's your hazard switch. Here's your lights. Here's your intermittent wipers. Uh, here is your climate control. Very much sands the air conditioning button, which uh, frankly is horrific to me. I really do miss that on this humid and miserable morning, but I suppose in Tacoma, Washington, you don't really need it. Uh, here you've got an ashtray. Uh, I do believe the Japanese are big smokers and uh, still has the uh, lighter with it, which uh, appears to have been used once or twice, probably on one of those dirty weekends. No idea what this uh, aftermarket switch is for. Uh, there it is. I haven't tried to figure it out, but yeah, whatever. We'll see if something happens. And uh, still has the original factory uh, AMF um, uh, cassette tech, which is just awesome, and it works. I wish I'd brought my cassettes with me. I forgot, uh, but I tested it with a Journey cassette, and it's fine. Uh, here's a uh, very nice nifty center console. You've got your, uh, you know, your manual gearbox, your um, transfer case to put it in four high, four low. Uh, this one does have the manual hubs, which I should have shown before we go. I think they had a shift on the fly version out, but it's probably better to have the manuals in terms of reliability. So uh, if you want to run the four-wheel drive, you just click this guy uh, over into the lock position, and then you can get into four high and four low. Uh, also, the uh, build badge there, which is kind of nice. But All right, let's get back in. Fire this thing up. There's that famous Toyota warning buzzer, which is irritating as hell. And there's that, oh, for the love of God. What was that anyway? Rat. How do you go wrong with a rat? Um, but anyway, the 22, I mean, it's it's almost redundant to say it runs good. Like, duh, obviously, of course it does. Uh, you do have power steering. You know, that's it. Uh, it's all fine stuff. Uh, here's your rear view mirror. Here's your light setup. You got map lights and such. Uh, what the hell was this for? This is for the... Um this gives you maintenance intervals. It tells you how to service your propeller shaft. I need to service my shaft a lot. And uh, yeah, it's all good stuff. The other side, you got a little spot for a pen and your insurance. So all very nice. Let me get my seatbelt on. And we're going to go for a spin. All right, first gear, let's do it. Now, it's got a little bit of a star in the windshield. You can see that right there. I had it repaired by a guy, but it didn't go away completely. Uh, I wanted to, you know, I thought, one of the guys said, man, you got to change that. It's, you know, it's annoying. Said, it's the original Toyota windshield. How do you change that? I mean, it means something that it's still there. So, yeah, I left it. If you want to put another windshield in it, you can. But I like it having the original windshield that it came with. Uh, also, the dash has no cracks at all. Uh, I guess because Washington isn't a horrible sun state that just turns everything into the Adobe desert. Uh, the little quartz digital clock is still working. I'm going to give myself a little fresh air. I'm trying not to hit this nice woman with her strange hat. I have a feeling Dalton's windshield job is shit again, so I'll make the corner, and if it is, I'll just turn it off and pick it up at the end of the road. Yeah, 
you know, it's not that bad, but it's also too sunny. So I'm going to turn it off and uh, pick it up at the end. All right, and let's do this. So, you know, other than the VW Beetle, there's probably very few vehicles that are as internationally beloved as the Toyota truck. I mean, it is universally loved in almost every country in the world. And uh, you get a lot of thumbs up when you drive this thing. You get a lot of people giving you the okay symbol and not in the racist way, but in the regular way. And uh, it's just kind of fun to drive around, I have to say. Uh, you know, it drives, you've got this sort of high seating position, but you don't feel there's fifth. You don't feel like you're in some enormous vehicle. So um, it's completely unique to the Toyota world, I think. Unless you're in a Datsun or a Mazda of the same year, then it probably feels very similar. Uh, it goes down the road beautifully. I mean, nice steering. You've got uh, good responsive fuel from everything. You've got plenty of pep from the middle engine. I thought briefly about putting a... Um, a light bar in the back of this thing with those KC highlighters, you know, like in that Back to the Future truck. Uh, but then I thought, man, I'm just not going to drill into this virgin bed. You know, that just doesn't make any sense at all uh, to do that. And then I thought, okay, we, they've got these magnets that you can turn on and off. Oh, man, we are way, way back. This, this is a terrible time to be coming out here. Absolutely terrible. Uh, and I thought, you know, maybe I'll put in a light bar with magnets or something. Then, you know, you're being ridiculous, so the hell with it. It didn't get a light bar. Fourth is too much. And there it is. So look, I'm not going to ramble on and on. I'll pick it up again in a minute when I turn right and just do some quiet driving uh, to show you how it runs and drives, which is great. Uh, this one's going to be for sale at Auto House of Naples. If you have an interest, you can give those guys a call. 239-263-8500. Uh, uh, you might be surprised at what these things became worth over the last few years. <laughs> like me, you look at it and you think there's a five grand pickup truck. Uh, don't bother calling. They don't go for that anymore, uh, which is uh, actually a damn shame because that's when they were the best, but um, they're pretty friggin' collectible now. Uh, but anyway, there it is. So uh, you can give those guys a call. Otherwise, I'm going to try to get some more stuff coming up. Uh, I'm not going to make stupid promises about Cordobas or Silverados other than to say they will come at some point. They will be around, just not today. Thank you very much for having a look. Appreciate it. If you want to see a little driving without my annoying tirade over the top of it, then uh, that'll come up right after this segment. Uh, we'll see you with the next one. Take care.